All right, so welcome to our second um, region of the year. We're going to be talking about South and Southeast Asia. So let's kind of get some terminology here. South Asia is what people would today commonly refer to as India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Um, so that's South Asia. And then Southeast Asia, we're talking about regions like Cambodia, Myanmar, um, what used to be Burma, Vietnam, those kinds of places, um, Malaysia. And so those are the regions that we're going to cover in this lecture. Now, this will be a multi-part lecture. And so what we start here, part one is going to deal with some of the major faiths that develop in this part of the world, um, and then major faiths that come in. And so on the left, we've talked about Islam already. So this is the symbol for Islam, or a symbol for Islam, the crescent moon. And then on the right, we're going to see this is a symbol, or a symbol, for Hinduism with the Om symbol. Um, and so the first part of this lecture, like I said, is really going to focus on religion. So we're going to talk about Hinduism, Buddhism. And at the very end of part one, we're going to talk about the introduction of Islam into South Asia. So let's go ahead and start. It says society in South Asia, number, uh, number one, the caste system. So the caste system is what we might call um, is the class system. In fact, caste comes from a Portuguese word for class. Um, and so traditionally in India, there are going to be four, maybe five major castes. And so what we see here is we can envision castes or classes as a human being. Up here we have the Brahmin. Um, and the Brahmin is the pre priestly caste, right? They are the people that are the mouthpiece of the gods, right? They're going to talk for the gods of the people of the earth. Then the second caste, if we're going down in power and influence um, and social standing, is the Kshatriya. And the Kshatriya is the warrior caste. And it makes sense that these people would be near the top because they have the weapons. But they also will tend to be people who are the nobility, people who are the big landowners, people who are the movers and the shakers in society. Then what we have is the Vaisha, right? Um, and so let's go back for a second. Kshatriya, the warriors, you can see that they are the arms, right? The, the, the part of the body that wields a, a, a sword or a spear or an, a bow and arrow. Then we have the Vaisha. The Vaisha is the caste that's going to be the group of people that are um, artisans, merchants, people that are not at the top, but they get by, they make some money, um, they might have their own businesses, those kinds of things. So they do some of the heavy lifting in society, they do a lot of the work. And then we have the Shudras, and the Shudras are down here at the feet, maybe even below the feet. They are what later will be known that will come out of this caste as the untouchables. Um, and so these are the people that have no land, no skills, um, and so they are landless workers. Um, and so we see in this picture on the right, we see this is somebody who might be from the Shudra caste. Um, he is, there's going to be maybe the largest in number, because that's usually the biggest chunk of any society, the people on the bottom of society. They're the poorest. They don't have any political power. Um, they're looked down upon by everybody else because they just don't have any skills that, that are rare that you could charge a lot more for, for using that skill. And so there we go. That's the caste system. And everything about India socially at this time is divided into castes. So again, we have the Brahmin priests, the Kshatriya warriors, going further down the Vaisha, who are the merchants and artisans, and then we have the manual laborers, Shudras, on the bottom. And so let's, let's um, so here's another way of looking at it. Now, in this caste pyramid, we see that we have a fifth caste, the pariah, or the untouchables. And that will kind of develop later on in India's history. Um, but they are going to be even lower. They're going to be performing duties that are not just manual labor, but are considered unclean um, labor. People, the jobs that are, that are, that might be think of as dirty, that nobody else wants to touch. Um, and so here we have the four slash five castes of India. Now, what does the caste determine, right? Well, your caste determines everything about you. And we'll talk about Jati in a second. Your caste determines um, who you can marry. It determines what you do for a living. It determines the clothes you can wear, the friends you can have. All of these things are determined by your caste or class. Um, and so, you know, so we see it's a very rigid society. Um, people interact with only people that are in their caste. Now, as time goes on in India, um, and we get kind of closer to where this course begins around 1200, 
um, we're going to see the development of something called Jati. Jati is to take this, this caste system that I've described as four or five castes and to make it much more complex. Jati are going to be subdivisions of that caste. So let's look at here the Vaisha, right? The skilled merchants. And so the Vaisha, we have everybody who is a merchant will be in this caste. Um, and they can only do merchant jobs. They can only marry people from a merchant family. Um, they, they can wear certain clothes that designate them as merchants and their friends are merchants. And so, so it's kind of this self-contained society. But Jati develops as more trade develops in India or South Asia becomes richer and there's more people that come in. Um, what we see is these four or five castes are not enough. Right? Because there's going to be all kinds of different merchants. There might be a diamond merchant or a rope merchant or a silk merchant. And so what you sell and who you sell to, some merchants will be wealthier than other merchants. And so we get these subcasts known as jati. Right? And so at the top of the Vaisha, maybe you have diamond merchants. And then maybe if you go down levels in the subcast, maybe you have a, a rope merchant, right? Or maybe you have a clothing merchant. Um, and here was the diamond merchant. And so we have casts within casts. And that is the jati. Right? And so not only does your cast determine who you can be with and who you can be friends with um, and everything about your life, but then it's even further divided into these jati. Now, um, the, the, especially the merchant, the Vaisha Jati, um, these, these will determine more than just what we said before, occupation, spouse, close friends. They will also determine what you do as an artisan or a merchant. They will determine um, what prices you can charge. Um, so if I'm a member of the diamond jati, um, you know, I say, well, I want to charge, I don't know, $5 a diamond, whatever, right? But my, my whole jati has to agree to that. Um, or else we might get kicked out of the jati, and that is horrible if you get kicked out of your caste because now you have nobody that you can associate with, right? You're, you're classless, you're, you're casteless. Um, and so there's tremendous social pressure to conform. And so these merchant jati, they all will, as a group, decide what to set their prices as, what their quality should be. Should we have flawed diamonds or should we have perfectly cut diamonds, right? Um, and so they're kind of self-regulating in this little tiny sub-community of what our work and play and free time and leisure time should be. They also will determine justice for one another. So if one member of a jati has a disagreement with another member, then that jati as a group will decide who is right, who is wrong, and what the punishment should be. And then, of course, welfare. And so let's say a person in your jati, a fellow diamond merchant, he dies for whatever reason and he leaves a widow and, and kids. Well, then the rest of the members in that merchant jati will take care of the widow and the kids, making sure that none of them starve. And so what we see here is we have kind of this society that's not really dependent on government. We have a society where you don't look to the government to set prices and quantity and quality or to provide a legal system um, or to take care of the poor, but you have the social system that is developed to do that. Now we will have government of course in South Asia, but South Asia is a very decentralized historically place. There are empires that pop up here and there and we will talk about them, but even those empires are decentralized where there's not a lot of central emperor control and there's a lot of local control and without that central localized all power I'm sorry centralized all powerful government you have to have something to step into the breach here something that will step in and say look we can provide all of the order that society needs if we don't have a centralized government to do it. If we think about the United States um, today, right, we have a centralized government that sets laws, we have you know, state governments that set laws, county governments that set laws, we have all of this powerful government that says what you can and can't do, I mean, those kinds of things, and so we don't need this caste system, but in India, like I said, they didn't have this all-powerful central government traditionally, so you had to have something step in to make people's lives orderly and livable so we could all get along. And so that's what India creates here, this caste system. So how do you get into your, your caste or your jati? Well, it's not necessarily because you've earned it, it's because you were born into it. So if your parents are diamond merchants, you'll be a diamond merchant. Your husband would be a diamond merchant, right? Um, and so it's by inheritance. Um, you cannot move up or down caste unless you were just kicked out of your caste and then you're without, outside of the society completely, right? And so if your, um, if your parents were shudras, unskilled workers, 
then you're going to be an unskilled worker. And no matter how hard you work, no matter how rich you may try to get, you're never going to be able to move up out of that caste and you'll always look, be looked down upon by the other castes. Um, and so that we see that. Now, within the caste, Jati can move up and down. So, for example, um, when we talked about the Vaisha, we had a clothing merchant here, and we had a rope merchant here, and we had diamond merchants here. As a whole Jati, let's say that you're in some part of India, and you know you really make a lot of money selling rope, and you're becoming really wealthy. So, in that city, you might leapfrog. You know, uh, this Jati might leapfrog the other one, but they will never be able to go so far as to become part of the warrior caste because you have to be born into that. So that's not allowed. So we do see some movement in society of class up and down, but it's only within the Jati, not whole caste moving up and down. Next, we don't see, if you look here, we don't see a slavery caste. Uh, there were slaves in any, but it wasn't very common. And so, you, you, as a historian, you might think, well, why is that? Were the people of India just, just some culturally way saying that slavery is wrong? That is not why we think that there wasn't a lot of slavery in India. It's because India has a lot of people. There are two major river systems in India that can provide a lot of food for people. And so a lot of food means a lot of population. And so with all of these people, there was just no need to have slaves because it's kind of counterintuitive to think about it, but slaves are expensive, right? Um, and so you only, we usually only see societies resorting to slavery when there's a shortage of labor. If there is not enough workers, well, that work is a resource. And so I am going to hold on to that resource as long as I can, right? It's mine. And so people will fight over that resource. Um, but when you have an excess of a resource, it becomes really cheap, and you don't need to hoard it. You don't need to hold on to it. And with all of these people in India, you just didn't need to have slaves. Let's, let's say you, you're a member of the Vaisha caste, and you want somebody to build a business for you, or you want somebody to you know, lace, clean, clean your front porch of your business. Well, you don't have to go and buy a slave for that because that's expensive. You have to house and clothe and feed the slave, and so slaves can be expensive. But you have so many excess people out there that you can just go and hire somebody, hire a pariah or a shudra for a day and say, okay, come clean this, and then off you go. I don't care where you eat and where you live. Um, and so when we have a surplus of labor, there's no need to hoard that labor. Uh, um, you know, it's not, it's not scarce. And so we don't see a lot of slavery in societies with excess people, with lots of people. So now let's switch gears because we've talked about class and society. So now let's talk about gender. Right? So traditionally in India, it's a very male-dominated society. And we call that patriarchal. Patriarchal means male dominated. And so we can give you, we need to give you some examples of that. You might put in an essay or you might just want it in your discussions. And so we have two. So what we're going to start out with with child brides. So child brides is a way for men in a patriarchal society to control and, and supervise women. So if I'm a man of maybe 24, Right? I'm looking for a wife, and I want a wife that I know will do everything I ask her to do. She will cook the way I want her to cook and clean the way I want her to clean, um, treat my parents the way I want them to be treated. And so I need a young bride who I can kind of mold and shape and say, this is how it's going to be. Right? Um, and so we see it was common practice at this time before 1200 in India, and then it'll continue on to some extent, um, we'll see that men would of 24 would marry maybe a woman of 12, um, maybe younger. Now, if she's younger before puberty, they would wait to consummate the marriage until she had reached um, puberty. Um, but this is a way for a man to say, look, I'm able to kind of train this woman from an early age how I want things to be. Um, and I can, I'm not, I cannot, an I cannot, I can, economist, I'm so sorry, an economist historian might say, well, there's a different way of looking at child brides. Um, it was a way of guaranteeing the family's wealth. And so if I'm a rich man, I want to make sure that when I pass my wealth down to my son, that it really is my son that it isn't somebody else's son that my wife has been messing around with. So if I marry a young girl before she's hit puberty, 
right? And then I make sure that she's, she's married to me, and then as soon as she hits puberty, she's married to me. She is the, I'm the only person that she's had sex with, and so I know, because I'm watching her, that, if, that whenever she gets pregnant, that is my son. And so a way to guarantee your family's wealth stays in, in your family line. So anthropologists and historians would look at this and say, these are perhaps two reasons why we have this development of child brides in India. So very male dominated. Now the second example we could have of um, patriarchy is the practice of sati. And we can see this in this picture. So sati is a way for men to continue their dominance even into the next life. And so if I'm a wealthy man um, and I die, I want to make sure that um, I have somebody to continue to cook and clean and serve me and love me um, and I can continue to love in my next life and so I am dead but my widow um, is going to be put on the funeral fire with me and she will be burned alive so that we both die around the same time um, and she can be with me in the next life and serve me and, and continue our love and those kinds of things and so that's an example of patriarchy men telling women even after death even after I die she has to still be with me. Now again, an economic historian may look at this and say, well, this developed as a way for, again, families to hold on to their wealth. So if I'm a rich man and I and I die, and my widow is still alive, well then maybe she remarries and all of my wealth goes with her to another family. I want it to go to my son or to my children. Um, and so by having this practice of burning the widow with her deceased husband, make sure that the wealth will all go to my children and not to some other man who remarries my wife. Whatever the reasons that why this developed, we see that these are two examples of patriarchy, men control in society. Now, so that's, that's societal stuff, right? When we talk about society, we talk mostly about gender and class. So let's now talk about religion. And there are going to be two major religions for our course that we're going to talk about that develop in India. And the first one we're going to talk about um, is Hinduism. Now, Hinduism is a term that we use in the West that is kind of a, a term for a whole bunch of faiths that we kind of group under this umbrella term, this catch-all term of Hinduism. Hinduism is actually many, many faiths that have hundreds of different gods and different traditions that they pray to and worship, um, and laws and ways of living that their religion says, but that's a lot of different religions, and so it's more convenient for people in the West to just group it as Hinduism. So Hinduism, just like Islam, we said that there are going to be basic beliefs that we can kind of say that more or less a lot of these different religions have. And a lot of these basic beliefs are encapsulated in what is known as the Upanishads. And the Upanishads can, will say some of the basic beliefs of many Hindus. So in Islam, we have the Quran. In Christianity, we have the Bible. In Judaism, we have the Torah. And one of the basic books in Hinduism as the Upanishads. So let's talk about some of the basic beliefs of Hinduism. Um, and so let's talk about the Brahman. And so the Brahman, or the Brahman, is this idea in a universal soul. And I'll talk about this hand symbol I have in just a second. But um, it's just a way of trying to get you to understand it. But let's just talk about the Brahman, the universal soul. It is this idea that all humans are interconnected with the same universal soul. So you, me, um, the people across the street, right, we are all part of the same soul. We are not individuals. In fact, individuality is an illusion. It's not real. We are all sharing the same spirit. We're all part of the same spirit or soul that connects all of us. Now, in the West, we think of individualism, and we think, no, I am unique, I am different. And so the individual part of the universal soul, the Atman, right, is, is, is the, the misconception. So if I'm Hindu, I might say, look, you think you're an individual, you think you're an Atman. But in fact, that's an illusion. We're all part of the Brahman. We're all part of the soul. And so I have this hand symbol. Nobody uses this but me. Think of the, the five digits on the hand, right, as individuals. That's you and me and your mom and dad and whatever, right? And we all seem to act independently like fingers can move independently. But when you come right down to it, they're not really separate. They're all part of the same hand. In this case, if we're thinking about Hinduism, the same universal soul. And so even though your fingers may go in different directions, like people, Atman, 
on may act and, and go in different directions. That's an illusion. We're still all part of the same soul. So what are the implications of this? Well, if you believe that we're all part of the same soul, then it becomes sacrilegious. It becomes horrible to kill another person because you are just killing part of yourself because we're, to we're all together in this. We're all part of the same soul and you're harming everybody. You're harming yourself and everybody to kill another person part of the soul. And so we see that this is this is really emphasis on pacifism, right? Not doing harm to others. And so yet again we see in India without the the traditional structure of a centralized government telling people don't do this, don't do that, we have to have something evolve that says how we should live our lives and we can all get along. And so the caste system develop caste system develops as a social way of saying we should all get along, right? Um, do your caste duty. Um, you know, stay within your caste. Don't make do things that make your caste angry. You know, everybody being cohesive and getting together. And then we also have this concept in Hinduism of the Brahman, the right, the universal soul. Harming others is really just harming yourself. And so there's all ways of trying to help society function in a cohesive way. So before we get in and we talk about reincarnation, one more thing to talk about with the Brahman is it just doesn't extend to human beings, is that all living creatures are part of the universal soul. So if you are you know, walking down the street and you see a bunch of people and you see, I don't know, a cow, well, that cow is also part of the universal soul, and that dog, and that chicken, and that bird, and that plant. We are all part of creation. We're all part of the universal soul. And so do me harm to those things is going to do harm to yourself. So we see that many Hindus are vegetarian, right? They would say, look, I'm not gonna go just kill that animal to eat it for meat because I'm harming, I'm harming all of us when I do that. And so that is another example of how Hinduism may be affecting how people live in society. All right, so now let's talk about reincarnation um, or as we might call it samsara. So samsara is the idea that as you see in this picture, right? Um, you see a baby being born and then the baby goes through his or her life, and then they get old, and they die, and then the cycle starts again, right? And you can just kind of see it going off in the distance. Rebirth, life, death, etc., etc., and it just goes on and on and on. Well, that's reincarnation or samsara. That, and it makes sense if you believe in the universal soul because you cannot take away from the soul. We're all together. And so when a human or a cow or a plant or anything that's live dies, it just doesn't cease to exist. It doesn't go to this heaven place right now. Um, it just is going to be reincarnated through samsara and we're going to see life be reborn because the, the universal soul will continue. Now, eventually, the, the cycle of birth, life, death, rebirth, life, death, etc. Eventually it can cease in a way, right? So let's say you go through, I don't know, a thousand lifetimes. Who knows? Pick a number. You go through a thousand lifetimes and let's say eventually you become the very best human being you can be. You can become the very best living thing that doesn't do any harm, that lives in harmony with everything else, right? And eventually you can break the cycle of rebirth and at that point you just become one with the Brahman, you become one with the universal soul, right? And it's really because you've, you've finally figured out that there is no such thing as individuality, right? There is no such thing as the Atman. This is just an illusion. And when you finally reach that point, maybe you can break that cycle and just forevermore be part of everything. You're in everything. You're in that plant. You're in you're that person. You're in that animal. You are reached enlightenment. You understand how the universe is supposed to work, and that is called reaching moksha. And so that breaks the cycle. And in fact, if you look on the flag of India today, we see this wheel with spokes, and it's supposed to have a thousand spokes, and those wheels represent the, the samsara, the reincarnation around and around again until you finally reach ultimate enlightenment and you understand how you're supposed to live and that everything is connected and you shouldn't do any harm to others, and you've reached moksha, and you've redeemed the, the ultimate enlightenment. Now, Along with this concept of samsara is the idea of karma. So in, a, in the West, we think of karma that if you do something bad to somebody else, um, that's going to come back and bite you, right? So if I cut somebody off driving, that some, somebody, they say, well, that's going to be karma that somebody will cut me off. And that's not really how karma works, right? 
Karma is this idea that as you go through whatever form of existence you have now, whether you're a dog or a cow or a plant or an ant or a human being, whether you're a Shudra or a Vaisha or a Brahmin priest or a warrior, wherever you are in this cycle of life, right, if you do good things, if you behave in society, if you maybe venerate your god, if you take a pilgrimage, if you do, do something that your religion says that you should do, you're banking up good karma. Um, if you do something, conversely, if you do something bad, you're banking bad karma. And when you die, whatever life form you're in, whatever stage you're in, when you die, the good karma and the bad karma will sort of, we can kind of sort of think of being weighed. And if you have better karma, you'll be reincarnated as another higher form of life. A more, a, a form of life that is even closer to moksha. Or if you have a lot of bad karma, maybe you need to take a step back and relearn things. And so you might come back as a lower form of life. And so let's, how does this fit into the caste system? So if you are in the caste system here, right? And let's say that you um, are in the warrior caste um, and you bank a bunch of good karma. You do all the things you're supposed to do and you do it well. Maybe in your next life, you're gonna come back as a Brahmin priest. And then in a Brahmin priest, which is the highest level of existence on earth, right? Um, you're a Brahmin priest and you've done everything you can. You've been a great priest and you've made the world a better place, yourself a better place. And you finally realize when you die, the Atman is the illusion and you just become part of the universe and you're not reincarnated anymore because you've reached the highest stage. And so that's how Hinduism kind of supports the caste system is because you should have respect for the people above you. If I'm a pariah, if I'm one of the untouchables, well, I should have respect for the Shudras, who should have respect for the Vaishas, and et cetera, et cetera, because they are closer to reaching moksha than I am. And so I should just focus on myself. If I'm in the unskilled working class, the Shudra class, I should just focus on being the best Shudra possible. I should not rebel. I should not get angry. I should just be the best person I can be, banking up good karma. And in the next life, maybe I'll become a Vaisha. Maybe I'll become a rich merchant. Or maybe I'll become a, a Kshatriya. I'll become a warrior. Or maybe I'll become a Brahmin priest. Right? Um, and so we see that there are all these levels that you have to go through. And this is a great form of creating order in society. It really makes it hard for people to rebel because they believe if they rebel, that's bad karma. And so don't worry about this life. I know what I'm supposed to do in this life, and in my next life, things will be better. And so there's no reason to rise up. There's no reason to rebel. And so we see this is a good form of social order, as we talked about strengthening the caste system. So let's talk a little bit more about Hinduism and its basic beliefs. And so what we have here, that as time goes on, and now we're talking you know, in, from like 600 to around 600 um, AD or the Common Era um, and so forth, we start to see there's this concept of dharmas, right? And a dharma is a path to moksha. How, okay, so I want to build up good karma, right? And I want to get to the next level of existence in my next life when I samsara and I get reincarnated. Well, how do I go about becoming a better person? How do I go about building up good karma. And so the way to build up good karma is your dharma. It's your path to building up karma. That's what that means. So lots of kind of terms here. Um, and so how does one go about that? Well, this is India, right? This is South Asia. This is Hinduism. If there's going to be a whole bunch of different ways to do it, uh, because we have a whole bunch of different kind of religious traditions that we group together under Hinduism. And so one way to build up good dharma is to be devoted to a specific god. And there are many gods in India, hundreds of gods in India. So you might pick one that um, is, you know, maybe you're born into a certain family and they have a tradition of praying and venerating and devoting themselves to Shiva um, or Ganesh or whatever Hindu god you can choose, right? Um, and so, okay, so that means to really to be devoted to prayers and do offerings and I'm building up good karma. So one way to, one dharma to build a good karma is to be devoted to a specific god or gods. Right? Another way to build up good karma is to maybe take a pilgrimage. Right? Maybe there's a, a site that is very holy to my god or to my, my um, caste, um, and so I'm going to go there and um, I'm going to go bathe in the river Ganges, and I'm going to complete this, this religious pilgrimage and this religious action. And people in all kinds of faiths do this. They take trips or pilgrimages to some religious site, um, and that makes them feel closer to their religion and their gods, and it helps them uh, experience spirituality, and so it helps them build up 
uh, good karma. Here we see on the left, we see people um, throwing dye at each other and celebrating their gods and their community and their culture. And so, again, it's this feeling of com community and all togetherness and oneness. Um, and so we see this is another way, just another dharma, another way of building up good karma. Another way might be mental or physical discipline, right? Um, and so this is where we see the practice of yoga starting, where you, yoga is kind of like meditating physically. So if you've ever tried to meditate, it's hard to sit down and think of nothing, right? Um, you know, you might think, oh, I'm hungry, or oh, geez, you know, I'm, 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 you know, I'm jealous of this person, or I really like that person, or what am I going to do tomorrow, or my job, or how am I getting enough money? All of those things are keeping you from thinking about either your God or what, what you want to do in life to be a better person. They're distractions. And so if you do something physically, it kind of distracts the mind, and it helps you focus on that one thing instead of these other things. So if you've ever done yoga, you have to hold a pose. And holding that pose really focuses your mind on that thing instead of thinking about other things that might be harmful, like I want to commit murder, or I didn't be really extreme, right? Or I want to be greedy, or I want to go harm that person, or I want to go take that thing. Um, and so these are just helping ways to focus your mind in a physical way. Um, and so we see that yoga becomes a form of physical um, meditation. Another way is study. Let's say that you are, you're in a caste or a jati where you're a scholar or you're um, a judge or you're a, a merchant, right? You're going to have to study to learn how to do the math or to learn how to do the laws or whatever. And so, well, that's what your caste demands. And so one dharma is just being true to your caste, true to your calling. If, if you have to study to be a lawyer, maybe that's part of your caste, some legal thing, right? Or um, a doctor or, uh, you know, a merchant. Well, you have to study to know the things you're supposed to know for that. And so studying for your occupation could help you reach good, get good karma to reach your dharma. Um, and so that's just another avenue to reach moksha and to, when you have samsara to be reincarnated to a higher level. Right? Next, to seek social, sexual, or physical pleasure. And so we're not talking about hedonism here. We're not talking about going out and just doing crazy things, right? But do things that bring you joy. And that may be spending time with your friends. That's the social thing, right? And family. That may be, you know, having sex with your spouse. That may be, you know, going out and, um, you know, doing yoga. Anything that brings you pleasure heightens your emotional state and helps you focus on that one thing. Um, and so all of those things are seen as of a collective good. And so you can see here that in Hinduism, it depends on what kind of branch and kind of Hindu you are. There are many, um, but we kind of group them all together. And so we can see that they are very, there are lots of different paths or dharmas to create good karma. And we've already talked about this, dedication to your varna. So another word for caste is varna. Varna just means your class. And so if you are a warrior, um, and you were born into it, and you know that that's your calling in life because it's your caste or your varna, then you go out and you be the best warrior you can. And by training um, and going out on the battlefield and being victorious, well, that's all good karma, right? That is your, your particular path, dharma, to building good karma so that when you die and you're reincarnated, maybe in your next life you'll be a Brahmin priest. And so there are, again, many different varnas, many different, I'm sorry, dharmas. All right, and so that's Hinduism um, in a nutshell. Let's now go to another faith that is developing at the same time, very similar to the same time as Hinduism in India, and that is Buddhism. And it's more specifically Theravadan Buddhism, um, the, one of the oldest forms of Buddhism. And so Buddhism, so Hinduism has not have one founder because there's so many different religions within Hinduism. But Buddhism is going to have a, a, a singular founder, and that is a guy by the name of Siddhartha Gautama, as we can see in the, on the slide here. Now, according to Buddhist, Theravadan Buddhist tradition, um, right before Siddhartha was born, his parents were, his dad was a local prince, a raja of an area near Nepal or northern India. Um, and right before his wife gave birth, a, a, a traveling oracle or fortune teller, if you want to think of it that way, a soothsayer, somebody who could predict the future, came to him and said, look, your wife's about to give birth to a boy. And of course, Siddhartha's dad was very excited about that. It's patriarchal society. And he says, look, and your boy could grow up to either be the greatest warrior ever 
and he's going to establish an empire and be very powerful, or he's going to be, grow up to be the greatest spiritual leader. One of those two. And of course, the dad, being a dad and being a prince, is like, oh, I want my son to grow up to be the greatest um, you know, warrior and greatest political leader. And well, the soothsayer or the oracle said, well, if your son doesn't leave um, this palace, if he doesn't leave this kingdom um, until he reaches a certain age, age of maturity, then he will grow up to be the warrior. And so the dad's like, great. And if he does leave, well, then he'll grow up to be um, the greatest spiritual leader. And so sure enough, right, the, the oracle leaves. And sure enough, his wife has a baby boy. They're like, this is going to be great. And so the baby boy is raised in prosperity, but it's a sheltered prosperity, right? His dad doesn't ever let him leave the palace walls because he wants his son, when he reaches that certain age, he wants him to go out and then go out into the world and create an empire and be a brilliant political leader. Um, and so we see Siddhartha is this privileged prince who doesn't, he's never understood suffering because he's never experienced it. He's always grown up with wealth and money and he's never had gone out in the world and see people die of hunger and starvation. So as the story goes, right, um, one evening, he was walking in the gardens of his palace, and he heard this strange wailing, uh, this crying. And he's like, I don't know what that is, over the palace wall. And so he kind of peers over the palace wall, um, and he sees this person crying and in distress. And it really shakes his world, because it's like, there is suffering out there? That's weird. Why is this person crying? Life is so wonderful. Well, Siddhartha didn't know that it's not wonderful for everybody in society. Um, and so, you know, so he's, that's his first kind of, one of his first kind of stories of him coming in contact with the world not being a perfect place. And that gets him thinking, right? And so then a few years pass, and before he reaches the age of maturity, where this oracle said he will reach, he decides to leave his father's palace, because this is bothering him. And there are other stories that kind of go along with this. And so he's like, I'm going to go out into the world. And so he leaves his father's palace before his age of maturity. And so the oracle says he's going to become the greatest spiritual leader of all time. And so he goes out and he's shocked, right? He's going around northern India and Nepal and he sees, oh my gosh, he sees hunger and he sees war and he sees murder and adultery and starvation. And he's just overwhelmed, as you can imagine one would be, with never seeing any of this stuff and living this sheltered life. And he just collapses, right? He just sits underneath this tree and he's like, I don't understand. Why are we on this earth um, if there's so much suffering going on and inequality and death and misery? And so he sits there eating just a few grains of rice a day because he can't be bothered to eat, right? He's got to be, he's trying to figure out the meaning of life and he sits there for days and days and days. And so that's why in Theravadan Buddhism, we say that this is the Buddha, not the fat, happy Buddha that we might see in East Asia. We'll talk about that later. But here is this Buddha, the starved Siddhartha, right? And he's sitting there thinking, you know, why is life so miserable and he doesn't have time to eat? And so that's why he's so skinny in here. And then eventually, boom, after days and days of almost starving himself, he comes up with the solution. He reaches enlightenment. And that's why we see this kind of halo figure around him, right? He's meditating. Um, you can tell that he's in a Hindu society. Meditation is a way to think about things. Um, so we see Hinduism and Buddhism kind of leaping out to some extent from Hinduism. And he's like, oh my gosh, I think I understand things. I understand why we're here and why all the suffering is going on. And he comes up with this thing that he calls the four noble truths, right? There are four things that everybody has to understand. And then, then everybody will reach this level of enlightenment understanding. And so here they are, right? The first noble truth is that life is suffering. Life is misery. And, you know, for you and I, we're like, well, yeah, right? But for him, he says, this is the first thing you have to understand, right? There is suffering in the world. For, so for you rich people that have never known that, there is suffering out there. Okay, so that's the first step. Second step, well, what causes the suffering? Selfish desire, right? That's the second noble truth, that all of the suffering in the world, all of the murder and mayhem and adultery and greed um, and inequality, it all comes because individuals try to have think about themselves rather than others, right? They try to have things for themselves and they don't think about the rest of the world. And so that's the second noble truth, that all of the suffering comes from selfish desire. All right, third noble truth, right? If we end selfish desire, we end all the misery. Simple, right? So if every single person just sits down, meditates, right, thinks about 
how they can make themselves better and stop being greedy, stop thinking, stop saying I want this or that or this, right? Then we're making ourselves better and we are going to make society better one individ individual at a time, right? Buddhism is not about going out and changing all of the world. It's about changing the world one person at a time. Change yourself. And if everybody makes themselves a better person and stops being greedy and selfish and starts to think about being a better person individually, the whole world will be better as a result, all right? Well, that's easy to say, right? Just end selfishness. Well, how does one end selfishness? How do you stop thinking about, I want more money? How do you stop thinking about, I want more food? How do you stop thinking about, I want to be higher on the social ladder than that person? I want people to give me respect, me, me, me. And so to do that, that's the fourth noble truth, right? In order to end selfishness, you must follow um, Siddhartha's way of thinking, right? It's called the Eightfold Path. And there are eight things, eight can additional steps that you should take that's going to slowly help you get rid of all of this selfishness, right? And so those are the four noble truths. Now, at this point, the Buddha knows all. He knows how to live your life. He's enlightened. And so, right, we stop calling him Siddhartha and we start calling him Buddha, which really just means enlightened one. Um, and so Buddha does not claim that he is a god. He doesn't claim that he's divine. He just says that I have sought, sat down and I have thought of a way to make myself and then the world better. Um, and so he's enlightened. So um, we can see that this is, this is not really what people in the West would traditionally think of as a religion because he's not saying that there are gods or no gods. He's saying that you know, this is just, you, this is the way you have to think and then you can make yourself better. And so it's a philosophical system, but as time goes on, it certainly is going to become this rich, vibrant religion, um, and we're going to talk about that. Okay, and so Theravada Buddhism, Buddhism, so we have this eightfold path. Now how... How do you end desire? And we said in Hinduism, there are many different dharmas. There are many different paths you can take to become a better person. Well, in Buddhism, there are eight, right? There are eight dharmas. And so here is a symbol for Buddhism. It's not the symbol, but it's a symbol. We have this eight-spoked wheel. Um, so in, in Hinduism, we have this idea that there are thousands of lives, so a thousand-spoked wheel. Here in Buddhism, we just have an eight-spoke wheel, and it doesn't mean that there are eight lives. It just means that there are eight different things you need to do to become a better person. And so there are eight dharmas. That's why we have this eight-spoke wheel, right? And we're not going to go through all eight of them, but we'll go through some of them. And so here we ha have is the right action, right? That's a, that's a path of dharma. So if you are going out in the world and you're harming other people with your physical actions, stop it, right? Be a better person. Have Act correctly. Don't bring harm to the world. Don't bring harm to others and be ascetic, which means give things up, right? Um, and this is a tradition. And so we saw this in Islam. We talked about the Sufis and they wanted to be ascetic. They wanted to live a life of devotion and dedication and giving things up. We see this in Christianity too when we see uh, monks, right? Um, they're giving up things as well. Uh, they're giving up wealth and, and talking and, and a whole bunch of things. And so some of these early Theravadan Buddhists, they're like, okay, I'm just going to not bring harm to the world and I'm going to give up money because it just leads to more greed and I'm going to give up sex because it just leads to jealousy and I'm going to give up all, and I'm going to give up property. Um, and so we live very ascetic lives. We're acting in a way that makes us less selfish. Next, we have right thinking. And so if you want to, if your dharma is to, as one of these dharmas is to just think correctly, so we have lots of meditation. And so as you see some inter interaction here with Hinduism, right? And so I'm going to sit down and I'm going to just try to empty my mind of every bad selfish desire and bad thought. And I'm just going to have a centered, quiet mind. Now again, if you've ever tried to do that, it's really hard, right? Um, and so what you do is you need to focus on a sound, right? So in Hinduism, you might do a physical stretch to focus on. And in Buddhism, it might be the om sound. Om. And you just kind of let that play out, that sound. And you're just focusing on making that sound or hearing that sound. And as that sound resonates, you're just focusing on that. And all the other thoughts, the distractions that make you a bad person just kind of melt away as you focus on that one sound, right? Um, and so that's one way to get rid of bad thoughts is right thinking, meditation. 
Right? The next thing we have, of course, is right speaking. You, you can bring harm to the world, as we all know, by gossip. If you say things that are bad about other people, it can bring harm to them. And whether we do it on Twitter or Instagram or Snapchat or, you know, whatever, right? Or just the old-fashioned way, me to you, that can be bad. And so some Buddhist monks will, they will not, not, not talk at all or talk just very sparingly, right? Um, because we see that this is a bad thing. Of course, I have this picture of this Buddhist monk talking to another, right? But for the most part, Buddhist monks who are Theravadan Buddhists, they try to live ascetic lives, quiet lives of contemplation and silence so they can not bring harm to the world but think about fixing themselves, right? Now, the goal in Buddhism is just like the goal in Hinduism because Hinduism has reincarnation, samsara, and so does Buddhism. Right? Um, there is this cycle of birth, uh, death, rebirth, death, until you get it right. But um, in Buddhism, you don't have to go through the caste system. You don't have to, if you're, a, if you're a lower caste person, you don't have to go to the next caste and the next caste and eventually become a priest and reach moksha. In Buddhism, it can happen anytime. Right? And so even if I'm a, if I shudra, and if I'm an unskilled worker, if I become Buddhist and I just start doing the Eightfold Path, I can reach enlightenment now, right? I don't have to be reincarnated, reincarnated, reincarnated. Now, Hindus call it moksha. Buddhists call it nirvana. It's, it's some extent the same thing. It's this idea of becoming one with the universe and stopping the, this search for individual, you know, thinking about myself. Um, and so we see that the goal is nirvana. It's to break the cycle of reincarnation, just like in Hinduism. And it's this idea that I'm going to become, I am going to stop being selfish and stop thinking about the individual. And um, I'm going to think about how I fit into the universe. And I'm going to become one. And at that point, you cease to exist. Poof, right? You cease to exist and you become an enlightened one, just like your mentor, Buddha, right? Um, you become one with the universe. And so this, of course, is going to be very appealing to the lower castes in India. Uh, because if I'm a Shudra, or if I'm a Vaishya, right, if I'm one of the lower castes, I don't want to have to wait around from lifetime to lifetime to lifetime to get reincarnated and eventually reach moksha. I can do it now. And so we see Buddhism is going to spread in India and be very popular among the lower castes. Um, Hinduism is going to stay very popular overall, but we're going to see Buddhism start to grow and grow and grow. Now, there is going to be one thing that keeps, there's going to be some things, but we're going to talk about this thing. There's going to be this that keeps Buddhism from just taking over all of the lower castes, is this idea of asceticism, right? Um, is that in Theravada Buddhism, as originally was created, the only way that you could really do this is if you, you became a monk yourself. Um, and so even if I'm a lower caste shudra, um, do I want to just give up money? and selfish desire and you know all of these things and just live as an ascetic monk with no with no property i don't think i want to do that and so that becomes a limiting factor so buddhism will spread to the lower castes of Hin india because it's appealing to the lower castes they can reach nirvana now but it's not going to just rampantly spread because of this idea of i have to live an ascetic life um, and so that's kind of keeping it from spreading as much as it maybe could have. Now, later on, we'll talk about different kinds of Buddhism that kind of get away from this asceticism a little bit, um, but that's later. Okay. And so, um, so let's talk about this asceticism appeal, right? We said that, you know, it's going to make it difficult to spread. So now we get to later, right? So now we're in a fast forward several hundred years, and we're going to get to this idea of Mahayana Buddhism, right? Mahayana Buddhists might call it the greater vehicle because it's just going to get more people on board the Buddhism train, right? If we want to think of it that way. Um, and so if, if you're, I'm a Buddhist and I realize that it's really hard to spread my message of Buddhism because you have to be ascetic, well, then I need to I need to maybe rethink what I'm doing here so that it becomes reachable and doable for more people. And so we see that as a second sect or branch of Buddhism that pops up is Mahayana Buddhism. It's going to increase its appeal to people. Right? And so how does it do that? Well, first of all, pe many people in their faith, they want to have a god to pray to. Because if you have a god to pray to, one, you can feel that spiritual connection and you feel like something greater is looking out for you and might help you in times of trouble and woe. And so people long for 
a, a greater power that to have a, a close spiritual connection to. And Theravadan Buddhism, as it originally ha was, did not have that, right? There was no spirituality because there was no God to pray to. Buddhism, Buddha did not say he was a god at this point. Um, and so he's just like, look, I have this great path to follow. And so, so Mahayana Buddhism says, no, no, no. Buddha was so holy and so enlightened that he actually was a god. Um, and so now people, in Mahayana Buddhism, we see Buddha become a god, and so that's going to attract more followers, right? Because you can have the spiritual connection to a deity, to a god. Next, Mahayana Buddhism is going to allow local figures to become Buddha. And we call these bodhisattvas, right? And so um, Buddha really just means enlightened one. And so here we see in this picture, right, we have the central, the original Buddha, perhaps. And then let's say I'm in a village that, ha that, that worships this god or that god or that ancestor or that really important figure in my past. And Buddhists would say, Mahayana's Buddhists would say, look, your god, your holy figure, your hero, your ancestor, whatever it is you venerated or worshipped, you're not at odds with us because your holy figure was a Buddha. It was a reincarnation of the Buddha. Um, it's very similar to Buddha. Like our Buddha was the, you know, the original Buddha, but maybe your Buddha, your local uh, figure was either rein Buddha, our Buddha reincarnated, or they also reached enlightenment status. Um, so we can kind of see this somewhat in Catholicism, right, uh, in, in a very tangential way. But we have God, and then we have these holy people who are saints that are really, really good. Um, and so you can venerate them, you can pray to them, because praying to them doesn't mean you're not praying to God, right? They're, they're both holy. And so we see that this allows Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, to spread to even more people, because not only is there a central God, Right? But also, your local figure that you used to pray to or worship or venerate can also be worshipped or venerated or prayed to. And so we have these bodhisattvas. In Catholicism, like I said, very non-tangentially, we might call them saints. But here in, in Buddhism, we have, Mahayana Buddhism, we have these, these, these reincarnations of the Buddha or also enlightened figures called bodhisattvas. And so if Buddhism spreads to your village, you don't have to give up believing in your original god. You just incorpor it's just incorporated into Buddhism. So it makes it easier to spread. Now, what direction does Buddhism spread from India? For the most part, Buddhism, uh, part, Buddhism is going to spread east along the Silk Roads and also southeast into Southeast Asia along the Indian Ocean trade routes. And this is a real common thing in world history, that merchants are going to spread religion, right? especially if I'm in India, right? So if you remember, merchants were the second to lowest class in Hinduism. And so Buddhism was really appealing to them. Now, maybe not Theravada Buddhism, but as time goes on, Mahayana Buddhism, because it says that they can reach nirvana now, right? And that they can worship whatever god they worshipped in Hinduism. Well, maybe that's just a reincarnation of the Buddha into Bodhisattva, and so they converted. And so merchants, of course, they're traveling all over the place, and they're going to, as you come into a new port, you're going to be trading with somebody in Southeast Asia, and they're like, oh, how much for this or that? And you tell them, and they're like, I noticed that you were praying to this figure, and you were having this chant. What is that? And you're like, oh, let me tell you about Buddhism. And so we see that religion typically is going to spread through many ways, but one of the most common ways is through trade routes with merchants spreading their faith from person to person. Now, here's another way it spreads through merchants. Let's say I'm a, I'm a Buddhist merchant, and I'm going to travel from India to, I don't know, um, Malaysia, right? And as I get down there, um, th the Malaysian merchant is like, tell me about religion, and you're like, it's Buddhism and whatever. And you, it's, you realize that if I convert to Buddhism, this, this Indian Buddhist merchant is more likely to trade with me than somebody who's not a Buddhist merchant, so I'm going to convert. And it's good for business. It's going to get me to trade with these people coming from India. Um, and so that's another way that Buddhism spreads through trade. We're going to see this again and again and again with Islam and Christianity and a lot of major faiths. All right. And so that's Buddhism for now. We'll come back to it um, again. Right, and so in 711, so we're not quite up to 1200, but we need to know, in order to understand India in 1200, um, we have to understand these faiths and where they came from, because they're still having an impact, even though they were created much earlier. Buddhism and Hinduism are still going to have a huge impact on how people work and pray and, and govern their society, as we've said. Right. So now here comes the third faith we're going to talk about. So of course Islam is created here in Mecca and it expands with um, the Umayyad and the Basid dynasties and etc. Cetera, et cetera. So in 711 we're going to see Muslims come into South Asia 
from the Khyber Pass here, from this pass in the mountains, and they're going to start conquering and pillaging um, and, you know, grabbing things from themselves because it's a conquering army. That's what conquering armies do. Now, as they come in, the conquerors are Muslim. Right. Now, these Muslim conquerors, they're not really that interested in converting people at this point to Islam. They're just there for conquest and plunder. Right? They're not trying to convert people. Now, that will come with more waves of Muslim invaders later on. Um, so we see Muslims come in for the first time, and they're there to conquer. And when, as they conquer, they're looking for riches. And what they find is they find these Mahayana and Theravadan Buddhist monasteries. Because we didn't say this, but one of the things, and, but now we are, one of the ways to reach nirvana, a dharma to reach nirvana in Buddhism, is to give money to a Buddhist monastery, right? So in Mahayana Buddhism, if I don't want to live an ascetic life, well, one way I can uh, get good karma and one way I can... Um, you know, be a good person is to give some of my wealth to a Buddhist monastery. And so I'm going to give money to feed the monks who actually did give up some wealth. And, you know, they need to be fed. They need to be clothed. And so a lot of these Buddhist monasteries become very wealthy as, as, as merchants and other people start to give them money um, because they know that that can get them salvation, that can get them closer to nirvana. And so these Buddhist monasteries, even though the monks themselves are poor and ascetic, the monasteries actually have a lot of wealth. And so Islam comes in, and this becomes an easy target. If you're in is India, if you're an Islamic army member in India looking for wealth, that's why you came, well, you're going to attack these monasteries because they have lots of wealth from people donating land and money and wealth to monasteries. In addition to that, the Buddhists, just like a lot of Hindus, the Buddhists are pacifists. They believe that harming other people is bringing harm to the world and it's hurting the universal soul. And so this is a perfect target. You're going to attack a monastery because they have lots of wealth and they're pacifists. They're not going to fight back very much because they don't, right? That's not what they're supposed to do. And so we see that with this arrival of Islam, a lot of Buddhism is going to be wiped out from India. In fact, today you don't see all that many Buddhists in India today. Um, it's mostly a Hindu or Muslim country today because of this Islamic invasion in 7-11. They're going to do a very good job of wiping out a lot of these monasteries and these Buddhist followers. So that ends for, that's that for part one. When we come back, we're going to start talking about um, Islamic empires um, in South Asia at this time. So we'll get to 1200. But that's all the religious background that we need to know um, as we go forward through this class.